I think we can start. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, today we will have a, a seminar presentation on uh, uh, first part of the carcinoma breast. So uh, today we, we have three presenters, Dr. Komal Sharma from Mrs. Kem, Dr. Milind Alavji and Dr. Shorup Shatra. Uh, Dr. Didi Man Moitro is also a professor of surgery at Calcutta Medical College in charge of breast unit. We will take us to this uh, seminar presentation. So may I request uh, Dr. Komal to Start your presentation. Share your screen. Yes, come on, you are visible. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, respected teachers. Um, I'm Dr. Komal Sharma from uh, SSKM Hospital, JR2, and I shall, be, I shall be presenting the etiopathogenesis and genetics of breast cancer. Uh, as per uh, uh, Globocan Global, Global 2018, so breast cancer is the second most diagnosed cancer in both sexes combined. It is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women. It is one in four cancer cases and has the highest uh, cancer-specific mortality amongst females. There has been a decrease in death rate due to advent of mammography and uh, use of adjuvant therapy. But in non-industrialized uh, nations, the incidence is increasing due to lifestyle changes. Around 50% of the women who develop breast cancer have no identifiable risk factor other than uh, increasing age and female gender. However, the following risk factors have been identified. One are familial factors, Second are the hormonal factors, next lifestyle factors, environmental factors, and the presence of benign breast disease. Familial forms com comprise uh, nearly 20% of all breast cancers and 80% are sporadic. Um, but only 5 to 10% of these uh, cases are, have a true hereditary predisposition. Uh, the risk of uh, having breast cancer is increased 1.5 to 3 fold if the patient has a mother or a sister with breast cancer. Family history depends on the number of uh, relatives with breast cancer, the exact relationship with the patient, the age at diagnosis, the number of unaffected uh, relatives. Significant family history of breast cancer is uh, two or more cancers under the age of 50 or three or more cancers at any age in the family. Uh, as we can see, the likelihood of genetic mutation with family history increases drastically with a uh, num rise in number of cases. If there are two cases of, of CA breast under 50 years of age in the family, the possibility of a BRCA1 mutation is 4% and that of BRCA2 mutation is 2%. But this goes up drastically if the number is 3. Uh, BRCA1 uh, mutation is likely to be 17% and BRCA2 13%. And so on, it goes on increasing. There are certain models uh, which, are, uh, which uh, are used to assess the risk for CA breast in a patient. Uh, the most uh, common are the GLOSS and the GALE model. The GLOSS model is a specific uh, risk estimate for breast cancer, which considers maternal history, paternal history, age at onset, first and second degree relatives. GALE, uh, GALE model estimates the chance of a, uh, of a woman of specific age of uh, developing breast cancer. It includes age of menarche, childbirth, number of prior biopsies, and first degree relatives with a CA breast, but it includes the paternal relatives and non-first degree relatives. It is adapted to consider atypical hyperplasias. Another model is the tidal cruciate model uh, developed in 2004. It uses personal risk factors for breast cancer, likelihood of BRCA gene mutation, and low penetrance, uh, low penetrance gene to assess uh, CA breast risk. There are certain uh, uh, genes associated with CA breast. Some are high and some are moderate uh, penetrance genes. The high penetrance genes include uh, most frequently seen BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, other than these two, uh, the PTEN and the TP53 gene together make up for uh, less than 1% of uh, CA breast cases. The PTEN is associated with Corden syndrome. The TP53 is associated with Lefromani syndrome. Uh, then there are CD, uh, CDH11 uh, associated with the hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome and STK11 associated with Bruce Jagger syndrome. 
the moderate penetrance genes associated with ca breast they include uh, check 2 brip1 pm <coughs> that is the ataxia telangiectasia ataxia mutation gene and uh, the palb2 uh brca1 and 2 mutations they account for 5 to 10% of all breast cancers they are autosomal dominant uh, tumor suppressor genes uh, women in families where a brca mutation is present uh, who test negative for the mutation themselves are not at an increased risk of ca breast in absence of other factors and do not require any special surveillance in contrast women with a significant family history of uh, breast cancer with the uh, Uh, absence of brc mutation in the family are at a four fold risk of ca breast brca1 is uh, located on chromosome 17 it is a tumor suppressor gene uh, that repairs double stranded breaks in the dna the absolute cancer risk uh, for a female with uh, with a brca1 mutation is 50 to uh, 65% and uh, in males it is 1, 1 to 2% uh, it is also associated with ovarian cancer A forty to sixty-five percent risk, pancreatic cancer, one to three percent risk, and prostate cancer around a nine percent risk in males. BRCA two is located on chromosome thirty. It is also a tumor suppressor gene and uh, repairs double stranded breaks in the DNA. The absolute uh, breast cancer risk in females is a uh, forty to fifty-five percent with BRCA two mutation. Uh, it is associated with a slightly higher uh, predisposition of male CA breast, that is a two to seven percent. Uh, absolute risk ovarian cancer risk with this mutation is uh, 15 to 25% pancreatic cancer 2 to 7% and prostate cancer in males uh, 15% uh, as we can see the uh, average risk of breast and ovarian cancer associated with brca1 and brca2 carriers are similar uh, the risk of uh, breast cancer is usually plateaus after uh, menopause The, there are certain family histories that uh, suggest uh, possibility of BRCA2 mutations in the family. Uh, one is breast cancer diagnosis at a young age, that is before 50. Bilateral breast cancer, occurrence of both uh, breast and ovarian cancer, tubal or peritoneal cancer, uh, breast cancer in one or more than one male relative, multiple cases of uh, breast cancer in extended family. Uh, one or more family members with two primary types of BRCA related cancers and Ashkenazi Jew uh, ethnicity there are uh, selected nccn guidelines on when to screen for BRCA uh, uh, on when to uh, test the patients for BRCA uh, one or two mutation all patients are to be tested uh, if uh, they have a known deleterious BRCA one or two gene mutation in a relative in a blood relative Or a personal history of ovarian fallopian tube or primary peritoneal cancer. Out of the patients with CA breast, uh, they should be tested if uh, they have one or more blood relatives diagnosed with breast cancer at less than 45 years. Personal history of bilateral breast cancer at less than 50 years. Personal history of triple negative breast cancer at less than 60 years, and personal history of male breast cancer. For patients with a uh, personal history of uh, breast or ovarian cancer, uh, for And a second, first or second uh, degree blood relative with ovarian or breast cancer at less than forty-five years of age, they should be tested. And uh, uh, patients with more than two first, second, or third degree blood relatives in the same bloodline with breast cancer, at least one of whom was diagnosed at less than fifty years. Uh, so these patients uh, should be screened for BRCA one or two mutation. The hormonal factors for the developing breast cancer include the uh, Duration of estrogen exposure, uh, that is uh, early age at menarche, there is a twenty percent decrease of cancer risk for every year that menarche is delayed. Nulliparity or advanced age at first full term pregnancy, and uh, late age at menopause. These are the increased risk factors. In postmenopausal women, obesity and HRT are in uh, hormone replacement therapy are associated with an increased risk due to increased estrogen exposure. most hormonal risk factors have a relative risk of less than equal to 2 for the development of ca breast the age specific incidence of ca breast you know, increases steeply with age until menopause and then it plateaus there is substantial evidence that estrogen deprivation by a hypogenic premature menopause can reduce uh, can reduce breast cancer risk premenopausal women who undergo oophorectomy without hormone replacement therapy have a markedly reduced 
uh, risk of uh, CFS later in life. <clears throat> the risk of CA breast in patients with known benign breast diseases. So in case of non-proliferative uh, breast changes like mild hyperplasia, duct ectasia, cyst, apocrine metaplasia, adenosis, and fibroadenoma without complex features, the relative or the uh, the relative risk is one, and the absolute lifetime risk is only three percent. In uh, proliferative diseases without a type A, such as moderate or florid hyperplasia, sclerosing adenosis complex sclerosing lesion or fibroadenoma with complex features, the relative risk is 1.5 to 2 and the absolute lifetime risk of CA breast is 5 to 7 percent. In cases with a proliferative disease with, with atypia, that is atypical ductal hyperplasia or atypical lobular hyperplasia, the relative risk is much higher, that is 4 to 5, and the absolute lifetime risk is 13 to 17 percent. And in case of carcinoma in situ, lobular or ductal, the relative risk is very high, that is 8 to 10, and the absolute lifetime risk is 25 to 30 percent. Uh, the risk factors graded by relative risk, uh, the risk factors with a relative risk of more than four, that is a very high relative risk, uh, they include female gender, increasing age, germline mutation of high penetrance, uh, strong family history, that is more than one first degree relative, uh, young age, multiple cancers, etc. Uh, then personal history of breast cancer and high breast density. These are the high risk factors. Then the intermediate risk factors are germline mutations of moderate penetrance, uh, high dose radiation to chest at a young age, and family history, uh, one first degree relative. And the uh, uh, low relative risk factors include the hormonal factors, that is early menarche, late menopause, late first pregnancy, nulliparity, absence of breastfeeding, and uh, mm, exogenous hormone therapy pre postmenopausal obesity and uh, environmental and uh, lifestyle factors like physical inactivity and high alcohol consumption. Uh, major pathways of uh, CA breast development uh, are shown in this slide. Uh, it is uh, shown that uh, uh, germline BRCA2 mutations, they usually go on to develop ER positive and HER2 HER2 negative, uh, that is luminal type of uh, invasive CA breast. Germline BRCA1 mutation goes on to mostly develop triple negative breast cancer. And the germline TP53 mutation with HER2 new amplification, they go on to develop uh, uh, HER2 new positive cancers. The, you, uh, the ER positive HER2 new negative cancers make up for around 50 to 65 percent of all cancers. The triple negative make up for around 15 percent, and the rest are uh, HER2 new positive cancers. So according to this, so there are uh, molecular subtypes of CA breast, luminal A, luminal B, or two new enriched and basal line. Uh, the luminal A uh, type is seen most, mostly in older women, older men. Cancers detected by mammography and are usually detected by, detected by mammographic screening. Luminal B is seen in mostly BRCA2 mutation carriers. Her2 new positive is usually seen in young women and TP3 mutation carriers. And uh, Triple negative breast cancer is seen in uh, young women, women of African heritage, and BRCA1 mutation carriers. Of these, the response to chemotherapy is less than 1% in luminal A, around 10% in luminal B, around 20 per, around 15% uh, in ER positive uh, HER2 new enriched, and uh, around 30 to 60% in ER negative HER2 new enriched, and uh, around 30% response in uh, triple negative breast cancer. Metastatic pattern is, uh, for luminal A includes bone, more, more common than viscera or brain. Uh, the same goes for luminal B. Uh, and for the uh, new enriched, the uh, bone, uh, bone, viscera, and brain all have uh, all are common. Uh, and for a triple negative breast cancer also, uh, all the different um, uh, uh, bone, viscera, and brain nets are common. Relapse pattern, uh, luminal A shows low relapse, uh, low relapse pattern and long survival. Luminal B has an early relapse peak at less than 10 years and late recurrence is also possible. In her to new uh, in this, the relapse pattern is bimodal with early and late peaks. While in triple negative breast cancer, there is an early peak at less than eight years, but uh, late, uh, late, late recurrence uh, is very rare and survival with metastasis is rare. Thank you.
So should we ask questions to her now? Or after everyone has presented? Action, action, kore question gulo kore ni? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Mitro, please. Yeah. We can have five minute discussion on this. Komal, uh, please uh, get back to your slides. You have said well, I want to highlight a few more points. So you go to the slides and we will go slide by slide. You have covered everything almost. Change to the... Hmm. Next slide. You must know the Globocan uh, incidents in uh, India. It is 25 per lakh. And in cities like Delhi, the national capital, it is 41 per lakh. Okay. Yes. New cases. Next, uh, familial factors. Yes, uh, you have uh, mentioned about the um, uh, relevance of presence of prostate cancer in the family. There is more specific mention of metastatic CA prostate with glisten grade more than eight. That is an important risk factor. All familial prostate cancers occurring in more than 80, you know, all incidences of prostate cancer in the family, even in patients who are detected at 80 or 70 is not important. Young age prostate cancer with uh, glissons grade more than eight, which is mostly metastatic is an important risk factor. Then uh, next slide. Yes, regarding the BRCA1 and BRCA2, when you do the pretest counseling, you don't straight away go for BRCA2 or BRCA1 genetic testing. Before genetic testing, there are various software based and other uh, algorithm based uh, models like the BRCA Pro, which gives an idea how much likelihood the patient has of being BRCA positive or BRCA1 or 2 positive. So first you assess the patients with a BRCA Pro model. So read a little about the BRCA Pro model, which is an important model nowadays, before deciding whether or not to carry out BRCA1 and 2. Of course, there's the NCCN guideline for whom to test and whom not to. But in course of your pre-test counseling, this BRCA Pro model, and there are some other models also, which will help you to choose your patient. Next. Gale model you should know in a uh, little uh, bit of uh, more detail, like what are the various components, number of breast biopsies, uh, number of children uh, before, uh, and how many children at different ages, how many uh, first degree relatives were involved like this, what was the age of menarche. These things are important. So you must know the uh, entire table of Gale model next. This, this was very nicely covered. I didn't expect that you will cover this, but uh, this high susceptibility, high penetrance, mo moderate penetrance and low penetrance uh, genes uh, are defined for breast cancer. And this is the entire list. You must remember this list of high penetrance at least and all the syndromes. P10 mutation means Cowden syndrome. What are the other conditions that, are, that may be present? Suppose a patient presents with thyroid cancer as well as breast cancer. You must think that this could be a Cowden syndrome. Then STK11 is Buse Jaggers. Uh, you said CDH11, it is CDH1, CDH1, which is associated with hereditary diffuse cancer. And you must remember that in CDH1, there is lobular carcinoma of breast. So we all know that for lobular carcinoma patients for follow-up or for detection, we prefer MRI. So you must remember that in a family of patients with CDH1 mutation, you should screen them with MRI. So that is an important point. Next. This is okay. This is not very like clinically relevant. Next. This you have said uh, next. Go to the, the list of factors that you mentioned. Uh, environmental, there was one list, right? Uh, regarding the hormonal factors, regarding the hormonal factors, uh, this is fine. You must remember that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, breastfeeding per se, you know, just the term is not enough. Breastfeeding for more than one year duration, that should be mentioned, is protective, number one. Number two, just causing, you know, menopause may not be very helpful all the time because increased circulating androgens are also responsible for increased incidence of breast cancer. 
and you have mentioned obesity you have to characterize the obesity a girl who's obese from her childhood and is being obese throughout her life is not as much as at increased risk as a girl who was thin or who was not obese in her younger age premenopausal age and she gained weight during the middle age so gain of weight or turning obese during middle age is an is a more serious risk factor than being obese throughout your life this this thing is there then also it has been seen that increased prolactin circulating prolactin levels may be responsible for uh, higher chances of breast cancer so we we take uh, don't pay it don't like you know everybody takes it like as if it is a part of their breakfast so you should caution patients about taking don't pay it don't next or oh, regarding the hormone replacement therapy hormone replacement therapy of more than 10 years postmenopausal is an important risk factor and ocp use uh, in most textbooks it had been written that ocps are not as much responsible because we are giving combination ocps but now it is being seen that even combination ocps could cause increased chances of breast cancer but the history of taking ocps is not important a patient who is currently using ocp has an increased risk of breast cancer after stopping ocps by 5 years time the increased risk again comes back to baseline okay next this is okay next no there was an, another uh, table like this in which you had written about uh, physical activities and all that uh, this one so you characterize like what do you mean by high co alcohol consumption it's more than one peg every day physical inactivity it has been seen that if a patient does exercise for more than 3 hours per week there is significant decrease in risk of breast cancer okay then uh, mm, high breast density what do you mean by that you know when you are doing mammographic screening patients are apart from their birads 1 2 3 4 they are also graded according to their scr grade of density scr a b c d that is also mentioned in the mammography report so a b uh, acr d patients with high breast density they are at a high risk so you can offer you know sometimes you do reduction surgeries in those patients therapeutic mammoplasty is on the opposite side if one side is affected by breast cancer you also reduce the opposite side to reduce the in increased chance of uh, breast cancer Uh, go back to the dupont and page classification uh, that that uh, classification of proliferative lesions and all this is called the dupont and page classification you have covered this well but i must say that all this relative risk that you have written and absolute risk this is if that patient is the index case in the family but if there is any history of breast cancer in the family all these risks will change like proliferative disease without atypia will become 4% proliferative disease with atypia the risk will become 7% for carcinoma in situ it increases you know for if there is presence of family history of breast cancer all the relative risk changes this percentage that is being shown is for ladies who do not have positive history of breast cancer in their family and fibroadenoma there are certain complex features that they have written fibroadenoma without complex features do not have much of a increased risk of you know, much of an increased risk of breast cancer but fibroadenoma with complex features do have so what are the complex features it is <coughs> intralesional cysts more than 3 mm papillary changes or ap apocrine changes and if there is atypical calcification within the fibroadenoma there are certain other features also so um, i think that would be uh, yeah things uh, we will cover I, nicely but uh, this even i think uh, recently uh, uh, the availability of the genetic testing and the cost was an inhibitory factor for uh, genetic testing but now uh, people have yes. relaxed more and yes. uh, and even some patient can ask for uh, genetic testing yes sir we can go ahead with uh, genetic yeah. testing in patients who want it yeah but pre test so, counseling is very important because yes. patients may have unrealistic uh, expectations from the results yeah. of and then uh, again yes if it is positive then then the uh, treatment uh, options are also very debatable is yes. not that we offer mastectomy for all patients like angelina jolie uh, because yes. uh, the positivity does not mean that 
uh, patient has to be uh, offered uh, all treatment possible. Yes, yes. And Komal, one more thing uh, regarding uh, the classification of breast cancer molecular classification, you have give, uh, given it correctly. But TNBC is nowadays further classified into claudine rich, claudine low, and uh, they have included metaplastic carcinoma as separate subgroups in TNBC. Metaplastic carcinoma, androgen receptor positive breast cancer. Okay. In TNBC, they have further subdivided. And BRCA uh, positivity in TNBC is an important finding because sometimes in metastatic setting, the targeted therapy also is different. You know, in BRCA positive TNBC, platinum based chemotherapy helps, and targeted therapy with Olaparib, which is PARP inhibitor, those uh, uh, agents are specifically used for BRCA positive TNBCs in metastatic setting nowadays. Now, gradually, they're shifting to adjuvant. Uh, testing in adjuvant setting as well uh, through RCTs. The results will come out soon. So this classification of TNBC is a new thing that has come. So please go through it in detail. Okay. Thank you. So we pass on to the next topic. Uh, that will be uh, the most important part of breast cancer management is a, a good triple assessment. So Dr. Milind Alokji is a second year uh, PGT at uh, MR Bangor Hospital present uh, triple assessment in breast cancer. Uh, good morning, sir. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Uh, good morning, uh, respected teachers and friends. Uh, today I'll be presenting uh, the topic on triple assessment. Uh, now, the triple assessment uh, is a combination of three tests, that is the clinical, the imaging, and the pathology part uh, that is used to uh, assess uh, any breast lump or any other suspicious breast symptom. And uh, together, uh, they can, uh, if done properly together, they provide a confident diagnosis and the positive predictive value of 99.9%. Uh, now, 30% uh, of females who present with, a, uh, with, a, with a, a breast lump. And other than that, the other signs and symptoms of breast cancer include uh, uh, breast enlargement or asymmetry, nipple changes such as retraction or nipple discharge, ulceration, erythema, or change in the skin of the breast, and axillary mass or musculoskeletal discomfort. So therefore, it is very important to, uh, to use this triple assessment tool. And one by one, we'll be seeing all the aspects. So first of all, we start with the clinical aspect. Now, the clinical aspect combines of two things, a proper history and a proper uh, physical examination. So uh, I'll just briefly cover up all the points. Uh, in the patient history, the first of all, the most important part uh, point is the, one of the most important things is the age of the patient because CA breast usually occurs in age more than 40 years. And uh, the, uh, the, the uh, age-adjusted incidence of uh, CA breast increases with advancing age. It is very rare in age less than 20 years. Then the chief complaint of the patient. Now, the most common complaint is that of a lump. We have to ask the mode of onset, the duration, and the rate of growth. In case of CA breast, it is a short history and a fast growth uh, lump that the patient noticed. Pain to begin with, uh, uh, carcinoma breast uh, is usually painless. Although in long-standing CA, there might be pain in, we have to ask for a history uh, uh, of pain in back, hip or shoulder. Uh, nipple discharge, uh, the nature of the nipple discharge, usually it is fresh blood or altered blood, can be serous also. Nipple retraction, the duration, a recent nipple retraction is more important. Skin changes such as dimpling, puckering, ulceration and constitutional complaints such as bone pain, weight loss or respiratory changes. Then we have past history, uh, any past history of contralateral or ipsilateral CA breast. Now, this is something that increases if the patient has a history of a contralateral CA breast, then there is a increased uh, likelihood of a second primary in the contralateral breast. Personal, in case of personal history, reproductive history is very important because a, it, uh, a prolonged, uh, 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 a, uh, a lifetime, it, a prolonged reproductive uh, years increases the lifetime risk of estrogen exposure. So we must ask age at Menard, the parity, the history of pregnancies, including the age of the first full-term pregnancy, history of lactation and age at menopause. Now in family history, uh, CA breast or CA ovary in any other member, in another family member, and also the menopausal status of the affected family member. This is very important because uh, first degree relatives, uh, uh, a, a presence of CA breast in the first degree, uh, uh, a, a patient who has a CA breast, uh, their first degree relatives are at increased risk. But if the patient has a pre-menopausal pre occurrence of CA breast, then the risk is even more. 
then treatment history any previous breast surgery or hysterectomy especially in the case of hysterectomy we must ask whether the ovaries were removed or not history of breast biopsy uh, and previous breast biopsies and any pathological findings in those and uh, any use of uh, hormone replacement therapy or hormones for contraception now next we come to the physical examination that the patient should be examined uh, examined in the well lit room with proper exposure of both the breasts after taking informed consent in the presence of a female attendant now the various positions in which the breast should be examined are while sitting arms by the side of the body uh, arms relaxed at the side of the body raised above the head now this uh, in this case a lump or a dimple becomes more marked and hands on the hip pressing and relaxing and any abnormal movement of the nipple or skin dimple becomes more exaggerated in this case then uh, in in a semi recumbent position where the breast flatten out and fall sideways in a recumbent where the palpation of the breast lump again the chest wall can be properly done and uh, done and the bending forward position which is used to see a properly uh, retracted nipple uh, now now first of all the inspection of the should be done of both the breast uh, the in case of the breast the position the shape and size any puckering or dimpling and if there is any swelling or ulcer then its relation to the four quadrants size shape and surface now dimpling can be uh, sorry uh, then the skin over the breast uh, the color and texture of the skin over the breast if there is any engorged veins again any dimple retraction or puckering is there uh, if pu uh, pudy or orange is there if ulceration or fungation is there the uh, then uh, we uh, have to inspect the nipple presence position number size and shape surface and any discharge now these are the various findings that we might see in the case of a ca breast patient now this is the dimpling of the breast uh this is how the dimpling of the breast uh, is uh, seen then this is a a very subtly a subtle breast lump ulceration uh, pudy or orange uh, uh, then nipple discharge nipple retraction this is a large fungating growth and in this case we see that there is a nipple retraction along with the uh, pudy or orange appearance now this is the importance of examining the patient in different positions now here we see when with the arms by the side the nipple retraction is very obvious but here we see that as the patient is bending forward the nipple retraction is prominent and with elevated and with the uh, the elevated arms we see that a subtle nipple retraction also becomes prominent so this is why uh, the patient must be examined in different positions now next we come uh, to the, the the areola the color the size and the surface and texture arms and thorax must also be examined for some specific findings such as cancer incuracy or the brony edema of the arm axilla and supra supraclavicular fossa for enlarged lymph nodes and finally arm should be raised above the head uh, to clearly uh, visualize the inframammary fold uh, this is can this is how cancer incuracy looks like next we come to the palpation now palpation should be done in sitting semi recumbent and recumbent position uh, a small pillow can be placed under the scapula on the side that is to be examined always palpate the normal breast first palpation has to be done with the palmar surface of the fingers with the hand flat and for further to know more about the lump uh, palpation can be done between the pulp of the fingers and the thumb the normal breast is described as firm lobulated impression with nodularity palpation has to be done of the four quadrants axillary axillary tail and behind the nipple now these are the various methods by which palpation of the breast can be done it can be either done in uh, the top to bottom in the vertical strips manner circ in concentric circles or in the wedge from center uh, palpate outside from the center in wedge Uh, in case of palpation any lump that is detected we must look for the local temperature and tenderness situation number the size and shape surface margin consistency fluctuation transillumination whether it is uh, fixed to the skin so we have to move it side to side up and down we have to slide the skin over the tumor and pinch the skin up Fix fixity to the breast tissue fixity to the underlying fascia and muscle for this two important muscles pectoralis major and serratus anterior for pectoralis major we ask the patient to place the hands on the hip lightly and we check for the uh, movement of the lump and then press them tightly on the hip and then again we check after the pectoralis major gets turned and uh, for the serratus anterior we ask the patient to uh, outstretch the hand against the wall fix it to the chest wall and palpation of the nipple then we have examination of the lymph nodes all the five group of axillary lymph nodes must be palpated properly along with the supraclavicular group of lymph nodes and general examination for the uh, for uh, liver lung bones uh, rectal and general examination so this was the clinical part next we come to the imaging part 
Now, the imaging part, the first of all, we have the mammography. Mammography uh, is the primary imaging modality for screening asymptomatic women. Uh, the breast is compressed between plates to reduce the thickness of the tissue. And it has a true positivity rate of about 90%. And it can also be used to guide interventional procedures, including needle localization, and needle biopsy. Now, there are two main types of uh, mammography that can be done. One is screening and diagnostic. Uh, screening mammography, we usually obtain just two views. That is the medial lateral oblique and the craniocaudal view. Although in case of diagnostic mammography, we add other views such as a 90 degrees lateral view and the spot compression view, which uh, helps us to uh, more uh, accurately identify any abnormal. So the mammographic features suggestive of, the, uh, of a diagnosis of breast cancer include a solid mass with or without stellate features, asymmetrical uh, thickening of breast tissue and clustered microcalcifications. Uh, now, clustered microclassifications are specifically very important because sometimes in, in young uh, females, this might be the only uh, abnormal finding. The limitation, first of all, is the dense breast as the sensitivity of the mammography increases only with age. And secondly, in 10 to 15 percent breast cancers, there is no associated abnormality in mammography. Now, there are multiple types of mammographies. Uh, earlier, we zero mammography was done. Now, uh, the screen film mammography and digital mammography is mostly there. Uh, digital mammography uh, we, uh, allows us to manipulate the degree of contrast and therefore it is superior in young women and women with uh, dense breasts. Uh, we have something called the digital best tomosynthesis with 3D imaging, where multiple projections are taken and reconstructed to visualize thin sections of the breast. And now we also have contrast enhanced digital mammography, which, uh, uh, which detects breast cancer at a rate similar to MRI. So just some mammographic pictures. Now here we see this is a mammography of a premenopausal dense uh, breast with a dense fibrograndular pattern. And in this is in the case of a postmenopausal breast with a sparse fibrograndular pattern. Now, this is a locally advanced breast cancer on the in the right breast, as we can see. And here in the left breast, the imaging is normal. Uh, now, this is, uh, again, it's a speculated mass is seen in the right breast with skin uh, tethering. And the mask is seen in oblique view is more clearly and with spot compression. Now, this is uh, an extensive DCIS and there is extensive calcification seen throughout the breast. Uh, now, this is a digital breast tomosynthesis with 3D imaging. Now, uh, a malignancy which was not uh, seen clearly on the 2D mammography is now seen clearly on a 3D mammography. And this is a, uh, uh, this is a, a contrast enhanced uh, picture of a contrast enhanced mammography. As you can see, this is also contrast enhanced mammography. Uh, something that was not detected on a standard mammogram was detected with the help of a contrast enhanced mammography. Now, when it comes to uh, the screening guidelines, uh, uh, the NCCN recommends that women more than 20 years of age should uh, go for uh, uh, at least one uh, 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 breast examination every three years. And after the 40 years for an annual breast examination, uh, physical examination, at the age of 40, uh, women uh, should uh, be given the opportunity to begin screening if they want to. At the age of 45, a yearly mammogram should be done. Uh, 55, uh, uh, Every two years, a mammogram should be done, and after fifty-five, uh, 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 after fifty-five, they uh, they should be given the option to continue regular mammogram as soon as long as they remain in good health. Next, we come to ultrasound. Now, the basic use of ultrasound are to resolve uh, equivocal mammographic findings to differentiate between solid and cystic lesions in case of dense breast, and to guide uh, fine needle aspiration biopsy, or pore biopsy, and needle localization breast. Uh, lesions. It, has a, it is highly reproducible and it's a high patient acceptance rate. Now, uh, the different uh, findings in case of different uh, uh, breast lesions, in case of cyst, we have well circumscribed smooth margins, benign breast masses, uh, smooth contours, uh, they can be round or oval shapes, uh, well-defined anterior posterior margins, and breast cancer usually irregular, will be uh, irregular, although they may have smooth margins as well. Also, uh, ultrasound is uh, used, uh, can be used to uh, image the regional lymph nodes and the features uh, of uh, lymph node involving cancer include cortical thickening, change in the shape of the node to a more circular appearance, size more than 10 mm, absence of a fatty hilum, and hypogenic internal ecos. The uh, limitation here is that it is not useful in screening as it is operator dependent and there is no standard screening protocol and cannot reliably detect lesions less than one centimeter in diameter. So here we have the ultrasound uh, finding of a simple cyst and of a complex cyst with a solid and a cystic mass. Then here is how a fibroadenoma looks in case of an ultrasound and how an interductal papilloma looks. 
This is a ultrasound image of a, a malignancy. It is an irregular mass here. Here, uh, we see that this is an implant on an ultrasound. This is an irregular mass in front of the uh, 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 implant. Then here is a uh, mass with uh, calcifications. Uh, this is a picture of a normal axillary lymph node on an ultrasound. Uh, if you can, if this picture is clear. In this case, this is an indeterminate axillary lymph node, and this is a malignant appearing axillary lymph node. Then we come to MRI. Uh, now, MRI, uh, the, there are multiple uh, places where a MRI is very useful. If it is an unknown primary with axillary lymph node metastasis, in case of Pages disease, to differentiate between scar and recurrence, uh, it, uh, <clears throat> it is the best modality in case of women with implants. Screening of the contralateral breast, screening in high risk population, especially in the case of invasive lobular carcinomas, and um, preoperatively to determine the eligibility for breast conservation. Uh, now, the American Cancer Society gives specific criteria as to where uh, uh, MRI should be used for screening. This is mostly for women at a high lifetime risk, that is 20, more than 20 to 25%. Or women with moderately increased lifetime risk, that is 15 to 20 percent. High lifetime risk are uh, such as those who have BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation, or first degree relatives, or uh, with BRCA1 and 2 gene mutation, but have not gone testing themselves. Uh, now, this is an image uh, that was a breast MRI showing uh, enhancement of uh, in case it is uh, with a breast cancer. And uh, these are again images. Uh, this is an MRI image of a breast revealing multifocal tumors that are not detected with the standard breast imaging. Now we come to BIRATS, a quick mention about BIRATS because it is very, it is a standardized uh, breast imaging and reporting system, uh, which uh, is used effectively and it is applicable to uh, mammograms, uh, USG and MRI, and it uh, standardizes the breast uh, imaging, image reporting. So as we can see that there are multiple categories and uh, based on the categories, uh, uh, we can uh, give a standardized reporting of the imaging. So such as a category two, uh, it would be a benign finding and this would usually, uh, the interpretation is we recommend annual screening. Category four, such as suspicious abnormalities, so two to 95% there's a chance of malignancy and biopsy should be considered. So this provides a standardized reporting for all imaging. Finally, we come to the last part of the triple assessment that is the pathology part. Now, uh, for biopsy, uh, in case of, th there can be non-palpable and palpable masses. For non-palpable masses, ultrasound localization technique should be done when a mass is present. And when no pass is present, stereotactic technique should be done. Uh, for palpable masses, FNAC or core needle biopsy. Now, in case of microcalcification, in case of non-palpable masses, it's important that the uh, specimen should be properly radiographed to confirm the sampling and a marker should be placed. If the entire lesion is removed in the biopsy, then a clip placement must be done accurately. So uh, this is how an FNAC is uh, done. A, needle, a 22 gauge needle is repeatedly inserted into the mass while a negative pressure is applied. Uh, the suction is uh, released, needle is withdrawn and the, the cellular and the fluid components are uh, fixed and cytological evaluation is done. Uh, the limitation is that it does not differentiate between non-invasive lesions from invasive lesions if malignant cells are identified. So core biopsy is anyways needed. And, but it can be utilized effectively to confirm a multifocal breast cancer in case of a second lesion and to evaluate a suspicious lymph node. Now, when a breast mass is clinically and mammographically suspicious, the sensitivity and specificity of FNA reaches about 100%. Next, we have core needle biopsy. It is the method of choice to sample breast lesions. Uh, it is performed using a 14 gauge needles. If it is a mass lesion, USG guided can be done in calcification. A mammographic or stereotactic guided biopsy can be done. And uh, in case of malignancy, the core needle biopsy must provide the histological subtype, the grade, and the receptor status. The advantage is that it provides minimal scarring, uh, low cost, and it can also give you the ERPR and HER2 new status. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Milin. You have uh, covered everything. Uh, you just go back to the slides. I'll just point out certain things I wanted to emphasize. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. Yes. Hmm. So this is okay. Okay. Regarding history, I've covered more or less everything, but uh, I think... Uh, Family history, it's not only about breast and ovary, uh, but also, you know, male members, you have to ask about prostate, pancreas, colorectal, thyroid, because you, we have just discussed the you know, yes. syndrome, different syndromes. Examination is fine. Uh, 
Uh, regarding the, the this uh, palpation wedge method, this is also you know in the northern uh, part of India because you might have examiners from there also. They will call this wedge method as dial of a clock method, and they palpate from the periphery to the center. So keep that method in mind also. Just if asked, you say yes, we can do that also. You do yes. your own method. And when you're inspecting, you have said you have to look for the four quadrants. That's fine. The axillary tail and the nipple areola. But don't forget to lift the breast and inspect the inferior mammary fold also. Especially for totic breasts, we often forget. And sometimes the lump is there only at the inferior mammary line. And okay. it's hidden by the totic breast. So don't forget to inspect that area also. Next. All this is fine. Achha, regarding that um, uh, podrange and uh, edema, everything I've said, if there is uh, redness or podrange involving more than one third of the breast, you call it inflammatory cancer, but there is one more criteria. It must be of a duration of less than six months. Suppose somebody has a huge mass for two years and now it has become red and edema has you know, covered more than one third of the breast, then you won't call it inflammatory cancer. It, 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 then the diagnosis would be going more in favor of cancer and QRS. Okay, so keep that in mind. Next. Hmm. Regarding uh, mammography, uh, you uh, see, I, I want to emphasize one thing. Whenever, uh, you know, uh, it depends from center to center, but it, at a good center, if you say mammography, what the radiologist does is she will first see, or he or she will first see with uh, conventional mammography as we do. And you have seen there is something called birad zero. When they are saying you cannot comment and further imaging is needed. They will never comment birad zero without doing an ultrasound. So when we send the patient for mammography, they will do a concomitant mammography as well as ultrasound, even if it has not been specifically asked. Because in better parts of the world or in developed nations and in you know, good centers, it has become a dictum that whenever a patient comes for mammography, you do a complementary ultrasound along with it to com complete the investigation. Doing ultrasound in a breast which has not been subjected to mammography is like you know, looking for a pebble in the sea. You don't know well. In mammography, you locate the tumor and for characterization, you go for ultrasound. And when you are doing ultrasound, Nowadays, they do two things. One is they will put the ultrasound on Doppler mode once and see the vascularity. Suppose you have shown one introductal papilloma. Uh, if you put it on Doppler mode and there is blood supply, there is good blood supply, you are sure that this is introductal papilloma. However, if there is no blood supply, you know that it must be some inspissated material blo blocking the duct. So doing a Doppler and looking for elasticity, tensile strength, that has also become, uh, elastography has also become a, um, one of, I mean, important thing. And when sometimes, you know, in very dense breasts to overcome the uh, difficulty that arises because of overlapping of images, this uh, tomography uh, has, you know, uh, come in. Now regarding uh, uh, MRI, when you're talking about MRI, you please uh, read about the COMIS trial also. It was a very uh, famous trial which was done and it showed that MRI causes over detection of lumps and all. So you must know the name of the trial regarding digital mammography, whether it is better than conventional mammography, go through the DEMIS trial. But these are important landmark trials. You might be asked about them. And regarding the screening uh, protocol that you have said, it is different for each country. In India also now we are having a combined uh, screening program for five diseases, CA breast, oral cancer, um, Cervical cancer, diabetes, and hypertension. These five diseases, non-communicable diseases, it is being run by the National Institute of Cancer Prevention and other institutes as well. So their recommendations are a bit different. In a country like India, if you say come after two years, the patient will, uh, you know, will be lost. You yes, call them more frequently. And regarding the uh, BIRADS reporting, you must know what is the standard Recommendation after BIRADS 1, what you should do after BIRADS 2, annual screening is good enough. After 3, you do a short term. Uh, this thing must be clear. You do not send everyone for biopsy and FNSC. And regarding comparison between FNSC and biopsy, there is almost no doubt nowadays that core biopsy is the most you know preferred thing. The FNSC has a lot of fallacies, but sometimes we are forced to proceed on the basis of FNSC because a patient who's going around. I lost a lot of time, we will again do core biopsy and there are some logistic difficulties in our country. So talking about both is fine. Uh, 
regarding the screening pro uh, uh, regarding the trials about screening you should go through the canadian trial of, of screening the edinburgh trial the uh, stockholm trial and gothenburg trial these are the four main trials done in sweden edinburgh and canadian trial which led to the um, inception of uh, screening so please read those things okay thank you if there is okay. any other thing that comes to my mind i'll message you okay So we passed on the last part of the discussion. Uh, Dr. Shorup Shatra, who is a second year junior PGT at uh, uh, Arkham Shyamadishan Biomedical Medical Sciences, will discuss on early base carcinoma. Okay, just touch on the salient points. Don't go into the details. Uh, Dr. Shorup, please uh, start. So uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, respected sirs. Uh, I'm Dr. Shorup from Arkham Shyamadishan Shyamadishan, sir. Today I'll be discussing on uh, early base carcinoma management. Early base carcinoma. Uh, those are the invasive cancers contained in the breast and may or may not have spread to draining lymph node or, or breast or armpit some ca cancer cells might have gone out of breast but cannot be detected those are called the early uh, as the early breast cancer which includes uh, from t1 to 2 n0 to 1 and non um, metastasized in the tnm staging and then uh, patients with that those are patients with stage 1 and 2 uh, Uh, we are concerned about those patients because such patients have a high probability of being cured of this disease with appropriate treatment. And uh, just uh, we'll go through the staging. So, just I think we can skip the staging. Yeah, yeah, yes. skip. Uh, our aim of treatment is to uh, is the complete removal of the tumor and prevention of recurrence. Uh, for workup, uh, we must give special attention in the clinical examination to search for salient features which will shift the patient. Out of her early breast carcinoma category, and uh, in the diagnostic evaluation, uh, we go for bilateral mammogram, USG, or MRI screening, and those are confirmed by coronal biopsy, which uh, must be image guided, which uh, establishes the invasive nature of the carcinoma grade and tumor biomarkers like uh, ERPR, HER2, and KI67, and uh, along with that, uh, routine PNSRI investigation should be done. The Among the uh, about the staging of the disease in early breast cancer carcinoma, usually no staging is recommend uh, is recommended, but uh, uh, axillary USG is, uh, may, may be used to stage the axilla. But in the eight AGCC, as they have added the prognostic staging along with anatomic staging, so the tumor grade, biomarkers, hormone receptors, and oncogene expression, including those uh, ERPR, HER2, new and multi uh, multiple genomic panels, they have uh, they uh, does the uh, stage migration. so the staging is imp important in early breast carcinoma also uh, like uh, incorporation of biomarkers in the prognostic system in the triple negative marker uh, tumors are upstaged in the prognostic stage and the her2 uh, positive downstages the prognostic stage due to success in the anti uh, her2 therapies and the the treatment should be multidisciplinary and the treatment of the um, tumor for the tumor that is the surgery is the first And then the uh, approach to the axilla, if there if there are axillary lymph nodes present or not, and the adjuvant therapies accordingly. Uh, for treatment for the tumor, uh, there are three options mainly pre present: mastectomy, breast conservation surgery, and arthroscopic breast surgery. Though in the modern world, the breast conservation surgery is preferred in all over the world, but in India still uh, today we go for uh, the most pre performed procedure in India is mastectomy. And um, the main indications for mastectomy are and those patients who are not fit for breast conservation surgery, who are not willing to go for breast conservation surgery, who are identified a high risk genetically like BRCA1 to carriers, and who are not fit or willing for going for radiotherapy. As radiotherapy is one of the major part of in the post breast conservation surgery period. Uh, breast conservation surgery. Which is also which can be also called as lumpectomy, quadrantectomy, or partial mastectomy, segmental mastectomy, segmentectomy, tylectomy, or wide local excision. Uh, it includes complete removal of the tumor with concentric margin, which is which are microscopically clear of surrounding healthy tissue performed in a cosmetically healthy manner. Or um, along with surgical evaluation or dissection of the axillary lymph node, and usually followed by radiation therapy. It's the preferred option until unless it is contraindicated. Now the factors which influences the eligibility of the breast conservation surgery. Uh, now, in most recent data says the tumor size, which is uh, um, the tumor size, uh, which is not so important as because if the margins are clear, then any um, size of the tumor can be um, 
uh, upstage uh, can be downstage uh, for the bcs category and for the margins for the adequate margins no and in consumer uh, policies applied and uh, in histology invasive lobular carcinoma and cancers with with extensive intraductal component can be treated with lumpectomy and, and uh, uh, in case of age the young younger patients weaker more than older patients and uh, in radiotherapy if uh, in post bcs radiotherapy uh, the decrease in recurrence in young is more than the elderly patients some other uh, uh, factors which also influences the uh, breast conservation surgery are the, like multicentricity tumor grade nipple areola status genetic testing inability to receive radiation etc the uh, among the contraindications of the bcs the, there are some absolute contraindications and the, some relative contraindications among the absolute contraindications that the um, uh, probability of recurrence probability of normal tissue damage from irradiation and, and personal preference and uh, among the content relative contraindications basically those uh, patient with brca one to mutation or patient who will have unacceptably poor cosmetic result in the uh, post operative period like was large tumor to breast ratio uh, more than 20 to 30% of the uh, uh, breast is co uh, covered by the tumor or retro areola or peri areola tumors and uh, relatively large medial lesions and very large breast and uh, in a short uh, we see doesn't have uh, the incision doesn't have to be placed directly over the tumor it should be circumareolar inframammary and laterally placed incisions are also acceptable and cosmetic skin flaps developed widely and entire breast tissue from under the flap till pectoral fascia bearing the tumor with 1 cm margin excised uh, breast tissue on either side and tumor bed is marked with metallic clips clips and breast tissue on either side is mobilized and uh, suited together and a uh, hallmark of successful bcs is achieving the negative surgical margins standard of adequate margin is uh, use of no ink on tumor and uh, which decreases the um, uh, rate of uh, ipsilateral um, tumor re recurrence has the potential to decrease reaccession rates improve cosmetic outcomes and decrease hip care cost the third is the oncoplastic uh, breast surgery which is the most modern and uh, most uh, uh, recent uh, development as a, as bcs is, uh, is established as a safe option for most women but recently this oncoplastic techniques have reduced surgical trauma and thus uh, capable of preserving the breast from the quality of life and it uh, it can be done immediately or delayed immediate or delayed the oncoplastic techniques are related to the volume displacement or replacement procedures including local flaps ld myoclonus flap and reduction myoplasty or mastopexy and there are different types of uh, oncoplastic breast surgery type 1 type 2 type 3 is there and now uh, approach to the axilla uh, if uh, if the axilla lymph nodes are not non palpable or no enlargement on imaging is seen then we will go for central lymph node biopsy and if the lymph nodes are palpable or enlarged on imaging we will go for usg guided fnc or trucard biopsy if positive we will go for axilla lymph node dissection or if negative we will go for central lymph node biopsy again the, to determine the prognosis of the patient uh, there are a uh, lot of web based softwares like uh, predict which prog uh, prognosis of uh, which pre uh, predicts out the prognosis of individual patients and um, according to the prognosis uh, assessed uh, will be uh, the patient will be counseled accordingly and uh, here we have to know uh, just uh, we have to uh, go for uh, two factors uh, the prognostic factor and predictive factor and the prognostic factors are those which are capable of providing information on clinical outcome at the time of diagnosis independent of the therapy like age tumor size nodal status tumor grade tumor proliferation etc and predictive factors are those which are capable of providing information on likelihood of response to a given therapeutic modality which depends on the hormonal uh, hormone receptor status or uh, erpr her2 those things and uh, adjuvant uh, radiotherapy should be ideally given to uh, all patients undergoing breast conservation therapy radiation of whole breast and a boost to the local tumor bed should be given and uh, accelerated uh, partial breast irradiation is uh, given nowadays and uh, post mastectomy radiotherapy is indicated in case of uh, patients with more than four axillary lymph node or uh, with pericapsular invasion or if margin positive and uh, just a uh, few lines about uh, accelerated partial uh, breast irradiation uh, that uh, localized form of radiation delivered after lumpectomy to only the part of breast where the tumor was removed it extends the treatment time by 4 to 5 days the interstitial brachytherapy which can be given by seeds needle balloon catheter etc suitable patients are 
patients aged more than 50 years, more than equal to 50 years, patients with low risk of DCIs, patients with surgical margins negative by less uh, more than equal to 2 millimeter. Now the adjuvant systemic therapy, uh, it includes chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, and tar targeted therapy or immunotherapy. And uh, the gene assessment um, is done here uh, for determining the adjuvant therapy. Like for negative, no negative risk carcinoma, it is done. If the score is high, the patient will need chemotherapy. And, um, and chemotherapy, as you know, it benefits all patients. Chemotherapy is genetically, uh, generally administered with combinations of medications in an effort to take advantage of non-overlapping toxic effects and maximize dif uh, different mechanisms of action in targeting tumor cells. Mainly anthracycline and taxin-based. Uh, anthracyclines are topoisomerase 2 inhibitors and antimetabolites. Uh, the main disadvantage or side effect is the cardiotoxicity and taxins are microtubule inhibitor. Uh, peri uh, permanent peripheral neuropathy is the main side effect. And uh, if the uh, patient is um, uh, having this uh, uh, anthracycline and taxin uh, resistance, then we'll uh, go for ixa vipilon and all those things. Now, there are specific uh, chemotherapy regimes. So I'm just skipping those specific regimes. Now, the endocrine therapy uh, it, uh, can, be of, uh, can be done by ovarian ablation, which can be surgical or medical, uh, by selective estrogen receptor modulator like tamoxifen, raloxifen, aromatase inhibitors like non-steroidal, um, like nitrogen, like anastrozole, or steroidal exomostin, anti-estrogens, uh, or selective uh, estrogen receptor down regulators, like fulvest uh, fulvestans, and uh, progestins, that uh, mistral, and sorry, endocrine in uh, hormonal study, according to the hormonal status, the endocrine therapy can be divided like uh, ERPR positive patients, premenopausal patients can be given with tamoxifen 20 milligram daily for 10 years and postmenopausal aromatase inhibitors for five years. And her two new uh, her two new uh, positive patients can be given uh, treated with uh, trastuzumab trastuzumab uh, for one year uh, uh, and uh, pertuzumab plus trastuzumab therapy. Uh, so about targeted therapy or immunotherapy, I have very little information about that. Uh, different, uh, the, it is uh, targeted uh, to different receptors or which can downregulate or block the um, carcinoma uh, transmission, like uh, lapatinib, which works against epidermal growth factor. In HER2 uh, overexpression gene, it is the second line drug after trastuzumab or uh, herceptin in case of uh, uh, HER2 positive cancers. Uh, Bupal receiver, a PIC3 inhibitor, uh, epitarsert, uh, the AKT inhibitor, and bevacizumab is the anti-angiogenic, uh, it blocks the VEGF. And sir, uh, one more thing that is uh, to, uh, uh, check, um, to check the, uh, assess the uh, recurrence or uh, to uh, assess the uh, those um, like okay, which adjuvant therapy should be given to the patient? The song, the oncotype DS or gene analysis, gene profiling is done nowadays. Uh, oncotype DS is uh, one of the uh, gene profiling. So Twenty based on twenty-one genes. And um, thank you, sir. Uh, go back to the initial slides. I will just emphasize. You have covered everything, but since uh, this is a postgraduate seminar, you must include uh, uh, evidence because uh, all treatments done nowadays are evidence-based. So what was the tri important landmark trials at least you mentioned? Uh, I'll just uh, summarize the treatment of early breast cancer quickly, uh, including DCIS. See, for DCIS previously, there was this uh, Van Nuys and all that. But for DCIS nowadays, they're saying that you can do uh, breast conservation wherever possible if it is not multicentric or, uh, uh, you know, uh, if it is a single lesion which is less than five centimeters, you can go for uh, breast conservation and with a margin of two millimeter, histopathological margin of two millimeter at least. And then if you have done uh, DCIS, for DCIS, you go for radiation. Do you need to do SLNB for DCIS? No, if you are doing lumpectomy, there is no need. But if you are doing mastectomy, you may do a sentinel lymph node biopsy because since you're removing the breast and you know if there is a focus of invasive carcinoma incidentally detected on the DCIS specimen, then you it will be difficult to assess the axilla later on. So if you're doing mastectomy, you can go for um, SLNB. What about the LCIS? 
uh, LCIS to sir, I can classical LCIS, yes. pleomorphic LCIS, classical LCIS ke tamoxifen di rakha jabe. If it is pleomorphic LCIS, only then we can go for excision of the lung. Yeah. Kito radiation lag bena thak. Ar, uh, eta galo, and uh, apart from this, uh, there is definitely the role of tamoxifen in ER positive DCIS, NSBP 17, then NSBP 24, uh, showed that there is uh, definitely a advantage of radi adding radiation after breast conservation for DCIS. NSABP 35 is underway for aromatase inhibitors in uh, DCIS and NSABP 43 is, is being assessed. And there's one Canadian trial also, which is evaluating the importance of using trastuzumab to, um, uh, in uh, trastuzumab as a radiation enhancer in case of DCIS. Now coming to invasive carcinoma, we all know that BCS breast conservation surgery was established as a gold standard almost for cases in which you can do it, obviously not for multicentric diseases or patients who are not willing or extensive uh, microcalcifications, intraductal extensions, apart from those, like in suitably selected candidates, BCS is the gold standard. What was the trial? NSCBP 06 of Fisher, and Milan 1 and Milan 2 trial of Umberto Veronesi. And then oncoplasty came in, Krishna Klaus papers in classifying oncoplasty and uh, describing them is very important, must go through them. And Audresh from Germany, his papers on oncoplasty must be read by you. Now, uh, after BCS, you must give radiation, everyone knows. And nowadays, actually see, previously we used to say, okay, if the lump is less than five centimeter, there is no axillary node, you may ask the patient to skip radiation if she has undergone mastectomy. But now with the post mastectomy radiation scores, you know, uh, coming in, uh, sometimes radiation is being indicated in even uh, node negative axilla uh, with tumors less than five centimeter in young patients, depending on the grade of tumor, etc. presence of LVI, etc. So uh, the way we used to counsel patients that BCS, you must need radi radiation and mastectomy radiation is not needed. This way of counseling must be done away with. Now, uh, regarding uh, the axilla, uh, there's this something called the sound trial in which they're saying that, you know, for T1 tumors less than two centimeter, if on ultrasound, there is no, nothing suspicious. You may even skip SLNB, but that practice has not come here. For all practical purposes, for all clinically negative axilla, by clinical, I mean clinical examination and radiological ultrasound uh, for clinically negative axilla, you should do sentinel lymph node biopsy. Previously, uh, there was this uh, concept that, you know, the sentinel lymph nodes that you take out must be subjected to, you know, uh, uh, subjected to uh, imprint cytology, etc. for looking for micrometastasis and um, other things. But the ACOSOC Zeta 10 and uh, the IBIS uh, SG2301 trial, they have done away saying that micrometastasis is of no concern. It, micrometastasis in sentinel nodes should be treated as negative. So next came in, uh, what to do with, uh, now SLNB was established by the Almanac trial and the NSLBP 32 trial. So read about those trials. Now next question was like for clinically negative axilla, we are not uh, doing ALND, we are doing SLNB. So what to do with clinically positive axilla? Again, if there is a palp palpable node or a Suspicious note on ultrasound, go for an USG guided core biopsy is done in good centers. If expertise is not available, you can go for USG guided FNSC. And uh, sometimes during USG guided core biopsy of axilla, you can put in a marker also, just in case you're giving NSCT. Sometimes later on, it is easier to do targeted uh, lip node dissection, but that is a different topic. We'll come to that later on some other day. Uh, so, um, you do USG guided core biopsy from the lymph node. If it is negative for malignancy, you can still go for SLNB. If it is positive, obviously you have to do ALNB. Now, what if you find SLNB is positive? Now, if SLNB is positive, nowadays they're saying that up to T2 tumors, because T3N0 is also early breast cancer. So we are not talking of those. T2, up to T2 tumors, if up to two sentinel nodes are positive for metastasis on histopathology, and if there is no extracapsular extension, you can go for just radiation as per the Acrosoc Zeta 11 and the Amaros trial. However, again, in India, our patients are not properly selected. Follow-up is a problem. So we are doing completion LND in case of positive sentinel lymph nodes. Now coming to adjuvant therapy, see the, the AJCC staging and that prognostic staging, etc. They have taken Oncotype DX into account. So when you are 
telling the answer in your examination, when you're answering in your examination, you must take that into account when you're talking about adjuvant therapy. Now, in early breast cancer, when will you give uh, radiation? Pratham, you know, the first question that comes. First of all, if you have done BCS, if the PMRT scores are not suitable, that is if the patient is young, even post mastectomy, if the patient is young with high grade tumor uh, or uh, triple negative tumor like that. And um, when will you, uh, and if the tumor is more than five centimeter, even if axilla is negative and uh, regarding radiation on the basis of number of nodes positive, there was this criteria of uh, giving radiation if more than four nodes are positive. But now, uh, one Richard Pito of Oxford, he has done an individual patient data meta-analysis and he has found out that even for one node positivity, if you give uh, radiation, it helps. Now the Prunklas trial is going on. So for one to three nodes also, whether to give radiation or not till that result comes out, for now, for all practical purposes, even one node positive, you should radiate. Then uh, along with um, uh, radiation after BCS, you should add boost doses. Uh, for BCS in suitably selected cases, you can do APBI. The trial regarding this was NSABP 39. You must go through that uh, to uh, know what was the favorable group of patients, what was the cautionary group, and what was the contraindicated group of patients. The detailed classification is there. You must know which are the suitable candidates. Now, regarding uh, hormone therapy, we all know that the NSABP 13 14 trial established hormone therapy, but in which group of patients you should use tamoxifen, in which group of patients you should use aromatase inhibitors, whether you should do a changeover in patients who were perimenopausal to start with, but went into the postmenopausal age group during continuation of hormone therapy, whether you should change over to aromatase inhibitors or not, which is efficacious. So there are several trials regarding this and how long you should give it, five years or 10 years, this ATLAS trial, ATAC trial, ATOM trial, you must uh, go through those trials. Uh, then there was this um, big 98 trial, etc. Regarding trastuzumab, uh, for her two positive, previously it was said that it would just increase the uh, disease-free survival, but now definitely it is seen that it adds overall survival by around six years if the treatment is completed. So NSCBP 31 established the use of trastuzumab. Then how, you know, pertuzumab, etc. came into the picture, what were the other trials? The HERA trial showed that, you know, instead of two years, you give uh, Herceptin for um, one year, it gives the same result. Uh, then there was, you know, several other trials were there. So uh, go through those. Now, uh, last but not the least, now for early breast cancer, we know that we go for upfront surgery. But uh, nowadays, there are several trials which are saying that you in triple negative or her 2 rich variety, you can treat with suitable targeted therapy or chemotherapy in the anterior setting. That is, you don't call it new adjuvant intent. You say pri primary chemotherapy followed by surgery. Uh, regarding chemotherapy in uh, early breast cancer, one thing I wanted to add, um, what are the indications? If tumor is more than one centimeter, if nodes are positive or hormone receptor negative, this group will get. But for hormone receptor positive, node negative, more than one centimeter up to three centimeter, you definitely have Oncotype DX with you, but cost is a prohibitive factor. In such patients, you have Indian uh, tests like the Sinuclein test. Then see this uh, ERPR HER2 status that we see on IHC is a surrogate marker. The actual is PAM50 or IHC4. These two are equivalent, but PAM50 is the genetic test for the actual assessment of e uh, bio, biological activity that corresponds to ERPR HER2 positivity. And then uh, uh, for uh, um, node negative, uh, hormone positive, one to three centimeter tumors, Oncotype DX is a must. You must also know about the Amsterdam test of mammoprint. And uh, okay, there's this we'll going on. Uh, no, act, 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 yeah. <laughs> for one to three, uh, uh, this was for node negative. And for one to three node positivity also, whether you can skip chemotherapy or not, one MINDAC trial is going on, similar to Oncotype DX. They're seeing the uh, uh, applicability of Oncotype DX in one to three node positivity breast cancer, positive breast cancer. So this is going on. So this was about chemotherapy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It was a very <laughs> nice discussion. Uh, all the yeah. presentations were They moderated very well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank, you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you.